morning, my brothers and sisters. Woo, I'm a little hot there. Don, can you pull me down? I'd like to welcome you all to worship here at uh, First United Methodist Church in Los Alamos on this All Hallows Eve. I'm Reverend John Nash, the pastor, dressed as my costume for clergy today, and I see most of you dressed as church members, so good costumes. Thank you very much. I'm joined in worship leadership this morning by uh, Sam, who is our lay reader. First Light, who we're going to be coming up here right now, uh, is made up of Valerie, Philip, Lee, and Kip. In the sound booth, we have uh, Don, Linda, uh, Mariana, and hopefully James, uh, who's walking in the door right now, and Tito and Kim were our ushers, so thank you to them for their worship leadership this morning. John Wesley, who we have memorialized here in pumpkin form, it's actually people who are watching online and have the best view of this, a little hard to see from those in the sanctuary, but he said, whoever you are and whatever faith you were born, whatever creed you confess, if you have come here to find God, you are welcome here, and we are glad that you are with us here this morning. For those worshiping online, we ask you to record your attendance, if you have not already done so, in the comment section so we know who's worshiping with us there. We plan a great worship service for you today as we conclude our worship series in Mark. And so we hope that you have come with the expectation that you will encounter the risen Christ, that the Holy Spirit will be moving and working amongst us here this morning, that we'll be transformed simply by gathering together as the body in Christ. And so I'm going to invite you to stand as you are comfortable or remain seated if that's more comfortable, and Sam will be leading us in our opening prayer. Together, let us pray. O Lord, Lord of hosts, we, we come, come to your mountain to hear your still small voice speaking to us still. To know of your eternal love and of your saving grace, we will tell of your name among the nations, of your mighty deeds among the people, just as the saints of the faith pass the story to us, so too we will pass the story to those not yet born. Future generations will praise your name and serve you, for you have done it. You have overcome even death itself and given us life, life abundant and life eternal. May our shouts of acclamation Rise from this time and place. May we never live in fear, for you are our God, and we are your people. All praise and glory to you, Almighty God. Amen. Because of Christ, we have been freed from our slavery to sin and death. Because of Christ, we are called to live in the light and to participate in bringing the reign of God. Because Christ lives, we too shall live. And so as we worship our resurrected Savior through song, you are invited to come forward to light a candle of celebration, hope, or concern, whatever it might be that we need to lift up to the Lord. And if you have a prayer concern or celebration to be lifted up in prayer later in service, you may fill out a prayer card and place it on the kneeling rail. For those worshiping online, you are also encouraged to light a candle where you are, and you may place your prayer requests into the comment section. Come, let us worship the Lord.
for us. You have shown us how to live. You have shown us how to love. You have shown us how to be your church in the world, and you died for us. So now we sing graves into gardens because you are everything, and there's nothing that's better than you. I search the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. Then you came along. And put me back together and every desire is now satisfied here in your love oh there's nothing better than you there's
thing is better than you. Lord, sometimes I think we say it with our words, but do we truly, truly believe it and feel it? And do we know that you are what can change everything for us if we will just surrender our lives to you? Let's sing, I Surrender All. And you may be seated. God does indeed answer prayers because earlier this week it was going to be Valerie and Camille, the only members of the praise team, uh, First Light. And then Camille wasn't feeling well, so we were down to Valerie. And so thank you to Philip and Lee and Kip for answering our prayers to God for uh, everybody coming in. So thank you for your leadership this morning. So before we lift up our celebrations and concerns to God, at the back of your worship guide, you'll find a list of celebrations uh, and activities we'd like to um, make you aware of, and a couple we'd like to uh, highlight, uh, and that is that we have upper room devotionals for November and December available. You'll find them um, in regular and large print, so you can find them at the back of the sanctuary, also in a bin uh, outside the door, so you can come by there anytime during the week and pick those up as well. Uh, and then um, next Sunday is a communion Sunday, uh, and so we encourage you, uh, if you're not going to be here in sanctuary, if you're worshiping with us online, come by and pick up uh, communion elements, and we do have gluten-free elements available uh, for that, and we'll also be celebrating All Saints Day next week. 
And so each week in worship, we give thanks to a member of the congregation for the work they do for us um, and or the community. And this morning, I'd like to give thanks to Sam Westcott, who is serving as our lay reader uh, this morning. And it seems like my experience in church that the Pentecost reading, which I think is the hardest reading we do every year, seems to always fall on one person. Uh, And I think Sam has had it now twice in my time here and does a fantastic job. He also serves uh, in our worship team in the the sound booth, uh, is also a member of our scout troop. So Sam, Sam, thank you for the work you do for us. We appreciate it. And one of our expectations is that we will be in prayer at least once a day. So again, in your worship guide, you'll find a list of the celebrations and concerns we are aware of uh, earlier this week, and a couple we'd like to highlight. Um, Prayers for the Judd family, in particular for Autumn Judd, who will be having surgery on December 8th. We had lifted Autumn up a couple of weeks ago because she had a brain brain bleed, uh, and so they'll be doing some work on that. Prayers for Monica, the mother of an ARC teacher who is hospitalized with COVID. Uh, And although our counts here in Los Alamos County were down um, for the week, that's sort of relative because this past week we still had more cases than we've had in several months. Uh, In October, we're ending in the second highest uh, COVID counts that we've had. So please keep yourself safe out there. Continue prayers for Selena Morgan recovering from health issues. Um, We'll be happy memorial service for Patricia Mendius next Saturday here at 1 p.m. And in prayers for Janice Courtright and her family, uh, her older brother died on Wednesday. Uh, and so she does ask that we limit um, the phone calls for the time being, but she would love to get emails or cards from you. She's just sort of overwhelmed trying to take care of that business. So prayers for Janice and John and the whole family. Also, in your scripture inserts, uh, you'll find a list of families to be in prayer for. That's one of our membership vows, is to be in prayer for one another. So we invite you to lift those up um, this week in your prayers as well. So as we go to God with our prayers this morning, we'll lift up our petition. I will say, God of resurrection, and we respond, hear our prayers. Watching for a new heaven and waiting for a new earth, we pray to the Lord. Church. O God, transform this broken body into a communion of saints, a company of the faithful working for good in your world. God of resurrection, hear our prayers. We pray for the world. Destroy this shroud of death, O God, that is spread over the nations. Replace the rule of wealth and war with your realm of justice and peace. O God of resurrection, hear our prayers. O God, we pray for this community. Make your home among among us. Dwell with us in this place. Let it be a city of heavenly peace, a place of refuge for all. O God of resurrection, hear our prayers. We pray for loved ones. O God, soothe those who are suffering, comfort those who mourn. Let us be glad and rejoice in the gift of your salvation and eternal life. O God of resurrection, hear our prayers. O God, we've named before you our celebrations, our concerns, and our joys, and we name before you now those that are known only on our hearts. O God of resurrection, hear our prayers. O God, as you have sustained your saints through centuries of service, 
Keep us ever faithful here and now until your will is done on earth as it is in heaven. We ask these things in Jesus' name who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Together, let us pray our prayer for illumination. Jesus, our Savior, you call for us to pick up our cross and follow. In hearing your teaching, help us to answer your invitation to discipleship with heart and soul and mind. Amen. Our first scripture reading comes from the prophet Isaiah, who has been giving a judgment against the earth and its rulers, and then turns to give a promise of deliverance for those who are oppressed and in need. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-matured wines, of rich food filled with morrow, of well-matured wine strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his people will take away from all the earth. For the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Our second reading is from the 16th chapter of the Gospel of Mark and is his version of the Easter story. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man, dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. This is the good news of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. So in your worship guide, you'll find a scripture insert. If you've not already been using that, I invite you to take it out. On the back has a place to write things to remember from today's service. Have you ever been watching a movie when it just sort, sort of suddenly ends? You weren't expecting the, the ending that was there. Perhaps because you think that's not an ending to a movie. What happens? There's still so much more story that's left to tell. What, what, takes place? what happens to the characters? You're like, what? You can't do that to me. There's got to be more story. What happened after that? I need more. Give me more. The Gospel of Mark ends just like that. Our earliest and best manuscripts have this, the passage ending at verse 8a, where we just heard, with the women fleeing from the tomb in fear and telling no one what it is that they have seen and heard. And our desire is to wonder if that's it, and to expect a little bit 
more. After all, we have more in the other gospel stories. And so, because of that desire of needing more and knowing that there's more story out there, later scribes or um, transcribers added more stories to the ending of Mark. And so, if you open up your Pew Bibles, and those who are worshiping with us on loan, you can open it up to to Mark chapter 6, page 55 in the the New Testament, the end of Mark. You'll see that after where just ended that passage, there's a heading that says the shorter ending of Mark. And then at verse 9, it says the longer ending of Mark. And you'll also see that there's double brackets around those stories. And there's a a translator's footnote there saying, again, these are not original to Mark, that our oldest and best manuscripts do not contain these endings. Now, part of the problem from the earliest days of the church is that the Greek ends very strangely there with the women fleeing from the tomb. And so there are several theories that are out there. One is that there's speculation that perhaps Mark was arrested in the midst of writing the end of the gospel and never got to to finish. Or perhaps there was an extra page of the gospel that got lost somehow really, really early in the church. Both of those seem very, very unlikely. And the best theory, the one I subscribe to, is that Mark intended to end it where he does. Because, in my opinion, if you pay attention to the, Mark, the story that Mark is telling us and why he is telling it the way he does, his abrupt ending makes total sense for his gospel. And I'll tell you why, although not quite yet. So last week, we looked at chapter 13 of Mark, known as the Little Apocalypse. And I said that it's believed by most scholars that the Gospel of Mark was written sometime around the year 70, give or take sort of four years on either side of that, right around the time of the Jewish resurrection, the revolt in Rome, destroying Jerusalem and the temple. And so when Jesus is talking there about suffering and persecution, this is something that Mark's community knows very well. It's also speculated that that the Gospel of Mark was maybe written in Rome. There's not a, a full consensus on that where the the church itself had been facing persecution under the emperor Nero with his fiddling. Perhaps the fiddling itself was the torture the church had to undergo. But while the Gospels traditionally been attributed to Mark, known as John Mark in the the work, the Acts of the Apostles, a, a, a a worker alongside of Peter, there's actually nothing in the Gospel to support that claim. It doesn't claim to be written by Mark. It doesn't claim to be written by anybody. But that attribution comes to us early on in the church. And I say all that to note that the reason why the Gospels even began to be written down was because in the early church, they had what was known as an imminent eschatology. That is, the end of time was going to be happening right now, right? Read the letters of Paul. He expects Christ to be coming back in his own lifetime. But when that doesn't happen, as they start getting farther and farther away from that, they realize they have to start writing these stories down so they don't get lost. And so we have Mark as the first of the Gospels being written down in order to be able to record these stories. But we also have 40 years of story that's built up in these communities. And so he doesn't have to have post-resurrection stories. He doesn't have to have, tell stories of Mary telling the disciples or other things that have happened Why? Because the community already knows those stories, right? As I said on the first Sunday we talked about, he's not writing history. He's not writing a biography. He's writing a gospel, which is about theology. And Mark has a very particular message and reason for writing the story that he does. And so again, jumping back in time a little bit farther... And has to look at Mark's account of the transfiguration, which plays heavily in our understanding and interpretation of the Easter accounts. You'll find this in chapter 9 of Mark. And Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up the mountain. And while he is there, Jesus is transfigured. And his clothing becomes bright white, right? He sort of takes on this heavenly role. And then they see him uh, talking with Moses 
and Elijah, the two who will bring forth the great prophet, great lawgiver, and also bring forth the, the beginning of the end of time. And so we are told that as James and Peter and John uh, witness this, that they're not just afraid, they're terrified. And then as they're coming down the mountain, Jesus says, don't tell anyone about this until after my resurrection. And it's, so what do they do? They apparently don't tell anyone. Presumably after the resurrection, they've told this story. But with the number of times that Jesus has already mentioned his resurrection, and will do so again, you would think that they would begin to understand this whole resurrection thing. And yet they don't. And they don't tell anyone, again, from what it appears, they don't tell anybody what they have witnessed. Although, if I had seen this, I'd be really hard-pressed not to tell at least one other person what I had just seen. But apparently, they don't tell anybody. And so, again, goes back to that theme in Mark of whether you're going to tell a story or whether you're going to keep it to yourself. And so, there are some very key themes in that story of the transfiguration and then play out in Mark's accounts of the resurrection. And it begins to, with their, to help us understand that as the women make their way to the tomb, including the fact the disciples aren't there, right? They fled in fear themselves. And so that becomes, plays out that whole discipleship thing. That the women, it seems are being set up, at least in the appearance, as positive examples of discipleship. Because they're, at the very least, they are there at the cross. The disciples have betrayed and denied and fled in fear for their lives into the night. Again, think of the parable of the sower. And Jesus says that one of the soil types is, you know, it looks like it's, it's growing well, but when persecution and hardship come, what happens? They don't have deep roots, and so the plants all wither and die. Their faith goes away. And so, again, perhaps maybe the women are examples of what good soil looks like. And yet, we're told that they watch the crucifixion from a distance in Mark's account. It's not quite clear why they're watching from a distance, but perhaps they too are afraid that if they are too close to Jesus, that they will be arrested and punished by the Roman authorities for being a follower of Jesus. But as if somebody once said, 90% of success is just showing up, they're most of the way there, right? At least they are there on Friday. But then again, it turns out they too didn't understand. Because it's not quite clear what the women might have heard or what they didn't hear. But we're told that Jesus gives his passion predictions quite out in the open to lots of people. So presumably, as his followers, they too have heard these predictions about that he has to suffer and die. And on the third day, he'll be raised from the dead. They're hearing the same story the disciples had heard, but they too don't get it. And that's clear because they're, we're told they spend the Sabbath sitting and waiting, which starts on Friday night, right? And then sometime after sunset, when the Sabbath ends on Saturday, and fortunately they're in Jerusalem, they're in a big city, so there's some store that's still open that sells spices that they can go to, and then they sit and wait for Sunday morning to begin. And Mark actually has what's known as a doubling here to, in order to emphasize the, the, the point of day, because he says they go very early when the sun had risen. Were they expecting to find Jesus resurrected? No. They had just gone and bought spices in order to anoint the body because there hadn't been time to do it on Friday. He had not properly been prepared for burial. And so they buy spices and they wait for Sunday morning to go to the tomb. They are not expecting to find life. They're expecting to find a dead body. And to make that even more clear, as if the spices didn't give us the clue, what is the big, biggest concern they have as they make their way to the tomb? Who's going to move the stone? 
Now, we talk about the upcoming scripture readings each week in our staff meeting. And this week, Philip said, you know, sort of makes me think of the, the parable of, of the sower, right? And Jesus says, you're, you're more concerned about the things of the world versus the things of God. Their concerns as they make their way to the tomb are very practical. The mundane tasks that have to be done. Who's going to move the stone? And it's not just one person who asks that. We're told they're all discussing this amongst themselves. They're all concerned about this. And so we might ask where that falls in their life of faith. And I know all the Marthas of the world will say, well, you know, somebody has to worry about these things. Somebody has to be concerned about the practical details so they'll actually get done. And it's true, but where does that help and where does that hurt us in our faith? Because as it turns out, the thing that they were most worried about, most concerned about, the thing that occupied all their conversation on the way to the tomb is not a concern at all because they get there and the stone has already been moved away. Their worrying turns out not to have been necessary because God solved the problem for them. And so they enter the tomb, and they see a young man in white robe. Again, think of the transfiguration, what happens to Jesus, so we should instantly identify this person as a heavenly or divine character. And where is he sitting? We're told he's sitting on the right side. Again, think of James and John's request. Let us sit on the right hand, that'd be the biggest seat of power, and the left hand, right? We're told that this person has power and authority because where we're told he is sitting on the right side. And we're told that the women are alarmed. And what does the man say? Don't be alarmed. Common phrase we hear in the New Testament for people who are terrified more often, don't be afraid. Although that phrase actually only occurs twice in Mark. Once here. And once in the story of the little apocalypse, where Jesus says, these things are going to happen, but don't be afraid. And then the man continues, you're seeking Jesus who's dead, but he's not here. A rephrasing of that found in Luke, as the angel says, why are you living, looking for the, the living amongst the dead? And then he says, and pay attention to these words. Go and tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him as he told you. And then we're told the women flee from the tomb in fear, and they tell no one what they have heard or seen. So much to interpret in so little time. Because for Mark, fear is a barrier to faith. We see that throughout Mark. Fear is one of the driving forces that keep the disciples from being able to see, from being able to hear, from being able to understand. Again, think of the healing stories and how they match up with what the disciples are doing. The disciples are fearful during a storm, even though they've already seen, seen Jesus do miraculous things. And Jesus says to them, why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? When they see him walking on the water, what's their response? They're afraid. When they don't understand his teaching, they're afraid to ask him to tell them what it means. On the last night of Jesus' life, they fear for their lives and they flee. And then it comes to its logical conclusion, because come Easter morning, who is not there? The disciples. But they are not the only ones who fear. Of course, we have the women here. Fear keeps them from telling their story. When Jairus' daughter dies and he thinks it is too late to, to do anything about it, Jesus says, don't fear, only believe. Fear is a stumbling block to faith. And the women have a choice to make on, when they go to the tomb because we're told that they're both afraid and amazed. That is, you can hold multiple emotions at the same time, but which one is going to be the driving force? Is amazement going to drive them, or is fear going to drive them? 
Well, it turns out we're told it's fear. Fear overcomes their amazement, and it drives them to be silent. And so there are two points I think that Mark is making. Well, there's many points. There's two I want to highlight. The first is about failure and redemption. Because as I said, when we talked about the parable of the sower, I, I believe that the disciples, I said, were all four types of soil. And I think the same is true for us, that we are all four types of soil. Sometimes we're multiple soils at the same time. And so we should find some help and some hope in the story of the disciples in Mark. Because the man says to the women, go and tell the disciples and Peter. Or some manuscripts say, go and tell the disciples even Peter. Normally in a list of the disciples, Peter's name is given first. List of names in scripture, first name is a position of prominence, and then it's hierarchical, usually from there on down. But here, Peter's name is given last. We might even question how that's phrased, whether they're seeing Peter's even being a disciple anymore. But the good news for Peter, and the good news for us, is that we are much more than the worst thing that we have ever done. We are more than the worst failure we have ever had. Because while we remember Peter's betrayal, denial of Jesus, it's not the summation of his faith, right? Because he will go on to proclaim the gospel message. He will go on to, to be the rock on which the church is founded. And he too will become a martyr for his faith. He will drink the cup from which Jesus drinks, and he will be baptized in Jesus' baptism. And so we should see that in Peter's failure is a call to redemption and forgiveness. And that God continues to call Peter, and God continues to call us into relationship, and offering grace and mercy and healing and wholeness and restoration. That we are called back into relationship with God, just like Peter, regardless of what it is that we have done. That God continues to scatter the seed into the soil of our lives. Whether it's rocky soil, or thorny soil, or hard soil, or even the good soil, God is going to scatter that seed, knowing that the Word of God is a powerful thing. And in a second leads us back to that opening question, which is, what is Mark doing here? Why does he end this story this way? And if all the disciples have fled in terror, and the women run away in fear and don't tell anyone, and no one else tells what they have heard or seen, how is the good news going to be spread? That's exactly the right question I think that Mark is setting up for us. Because it might seem then if the disciples are gone and the the women followers are gone, who is there to tell the story? Who has seen and witnessed or heard the story of Jesus? But the answer is, we have. Because we've heard and witnessed Jesus calling the disciples, come and follow me. We have heard and witnessed Jesus' miracle stories of healing. And we have heard and witnessed Jesus' teachings. And we have heard and witnessed Jesus' calling out people. And we have heard and witnessed the transfiguration. And we have heard and witnessed the last night. And we have heard and witnessed we've been at the cross. And we have been at the tomb. And we heard and witnessed the young man's proclamation. You come here seeking Jesus who's dead, but he's not here because he's alive. We are witnesses to it all. And so the question becomes for for Mark that we've heard throughout Mark, are we going to be quiet about that? Are we going to tell people what we have heard and seen? 
Are we going to be quiet? Are we going to go tell the world what Christ has done for us? Are we going to live lives of fear? Are we going to live lives of faithfulness? Because while I've said that, that Mark is a gospel without a beginning or without an end, that's true only in comparison to the other gospels. Because Mark has both a beginning and an end, and they make sense for what Mark is, is doing for us. And at the end, we go back to where we began. We go back to Galilee. And a movement away from Jerusalem and the structures of power and authority there out into the wilderness. Which, as I said in chapter 1, when we looked at it, that's where salvation is being found. And so we come back to that first line of Mark. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And so we have this good news. And so Mark's saying, what are you going to do with it? Because some will say Mark doesn't have an Easter story, but that's not true. What he doesn't have is post-resurrection appearances. He has an Easter proclamation. But it's different than Matthew and Mark, I mean, Matthew and Luke and, and John. And I think in that difference is the power and pertinence to us for Mark. Because if Mark had included appearances of Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, on Easter, then our call to discipleship in some ways comes at a remove. Because it's easy to believe the women and others who have seen the resurrected Jesus to trust in their story, not just some word that they've heard floating around. But here, that's not the case, because unless some of you have had some experience that you haven't told me about, we have not encountered the resurrected Christ standing before us face to face, right? And so the same thing is happening in Mark's community. They're more than 40 years probably removed from the resurrection, and that first generation is passed away or is close to it. So all they have now is people who are saying Jesus has been raised from the dead. They don't know people who have actually encountered the risen Christ. So all the women in the, the story from Mark have is this account of the young man saying, he's not here, he's been raised from the dead. And all we have is a testimony of people who have passed it on to us, saying Jesus has been raised from the dead. And I know this is redundant, but it's the important question. How then are we going to respond? Are we going to keep it to ourselves? Are we going to tell others? Are we going to run away in fear? Are we going to proclaim the risen Christ and what Christ has done for us? And the last piece is this is not an individual call. This is a community call. Because the gospel was not written for individuals, right? Mark's community could not say, pull out your pew Bible and turn to page 55 for the end of the gospel. Very few of them could read or write. And so the gospel was written down in order to be read into community. There would be a group who were gathered together to hear this text. There was no such thing as people doing daily scripture reading on their own. It happened in community. And so Mark sets out this call to discipleship and this cost of discipleship, not just to individuals, but he's saying to the church, this is what it looks like. This is what we are called to do and to be as a body of Christ. That this is where we're going to find our healing and our hope, our grace and our forgiveness. This is where we find peace and comfort. This is where we find the ability and the reason to overcome our fear and to live in God's love. Because love casts out fear, as Peter tells us. This is where we engage with God and work to bring forth the kingdom of God, the reign of God. Which has come through the person of Christ, the Son of God, the Messiah, the good news given to us. 
And so Jesus says, Mark says, pick up your cross and follow and be bearers of the good news. I pray that it will be so, my brothers and sisters. Amen. I'm going to invite First Light to come forward and for us to be in an attitude of prayer. We know that on that Easter morning, that day that we celebrate as a people, because we are an Easter people, it was not just Jesus who was resurrected from the dead, but the disciples' faith was even resurrected. That Peter was brought back into relationship, into wholeness and healing. And that James and John and all of them were brought back to understand the call on their lives, and they go forth to proclaim the good news, not just in their neighborhoods, but even to the ends of the earth, and to Europe and Asia and Africa, and even to here. Because we still stand on the shoulders of the saints who have gone before us, those from many, many generations before, and those one or two from before us who proclaim that gospel message to us, who told us of how Christ had changed their lives, of what you had given to them, of the love that you offered to the world. And so may we hear that same call this day and every day to be witnesses to the whole creation, as the longer ending of Mark has it, not just to humanity, but the whole creation, the world that you created would hear of your good news, and we would live it out each and every day. The generations yet to come would become faithful followers because of what we do here this day. So guide us and lead us in our discipleship. Help us to put away or overcome the fear that we have and to live in your love and to be light to the world. Light shining in the darkness, light offering you to the world. And we ask these things through the power of your spirit in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. And so in your worship guide, you will find a card which is leading us into our next worship series. And it says, who in your church family has made a difference in your spiritual life? And so at the end of the pews in the note card pocket where the pen holder, you should find a Sharpie uh, on either end. And we're going to invite you um, to take some time during service, or you can take this home um, if you need a little bit more time, and write down who in our church family has made a difference in your spiritual life. This is one of those times where we can give thanks to the members of this church for the difference they've made directly in our lives, or maybe just being that shining light of, that's the type of disciple I want to become when I grow up, right? Whoever that might be in this church, we want you to write that down. Uh, and then you, as you're leaving the sanctuary, you can just place it at the back, and then we're going to hang these up, and there'll be two more uh, questions to ask uh, through November, and we'll hang them up in the sanctuary so you can go around and uh, see what other people are doing. So before worship's over, I'm going to ask uh, all of us to fill those cards out, and it'll help inform my message for next week as well, as we name the saints of this church. So this week, uh, Philip was doing chapel service for the Ark for the kids, and they were here in the sanctuary. Uh, and one of the things Philip was commenting on, and the kids were commenting on, was just the the beauty of this space. And they were naming lots of things that they liked, asking questions. Everybody seemed to want to know what these white things hanging from. They'd never seen speakers so big. Um, but you know, this sanctuary is a blessing of this congregation, brought to us, given to us by the saints who came before us, who planted that seed and, and grew that, and we're reaping that harvest. And we want to continue that. And so one of the ways that, that your gifts make a difference is helping us keep this sanctuary in its condition, keeping it as beautiful in order to offer it to, to new generations who can come in here and, and feel the presence of God in this place. And so one of our membership vows is that we will support this church financially, which we say is giving a portion of your income with a tithe as the goal. And so there are several ways you can give. For those in the sanctuary, you can place your offerings in the offering plate at the front or the back of the sanctuary. You can give electronically by going to our website, firstinyourheart.org, 
Click on Secure Giving in the upper right-hand corner and follow the steps. You can text LAFUMC in a dollar amount you would like to give to 73256. Follow the steps there or simply mail your checks into the church here. So as always, thank you for your faithfulness and your generosity. Thank you for making a difference. We are indeed God's love in action. And let us pray. Mighty God of resurrection and redemption, we offer our gifts alongside our alleluias. We offer our hands and feet and voices to make the celebration out of this place into a world that needs hope and resurrection so desperately. May we go into the world with such energy, excitement, and power that the ground shakes once again, that lightning flashes, and that people see us in your redeeming love and the triumph of light over darkness. In the name of the risen Christ, we pray, and all God's children say, Amen. And our closing song is a reminder that we are indeed covered in God's love, from which we can never be separated because God's grace is enough. So I invite you to remain standing as you are comfortable and seated, if that's more comfortable as we close our worship in song. Restless heart. 
Several years ago, it was a Cokesbury B BBS, and that was the theme song for it. You might remember this, Valerie. That, during that, the, the chorus portion, all the kids had to jump up and down. That's what I always, every time I hear the chorus, I want to start jumping up and down <laughs> from that, that BBS. But. <laughs> Another expectation is that we'll be reading the, script, the Bible at least once a day. So in your scripture insert on the inside, you'll find recommended scripture readings for each day of the week. Uh, prayer for the week, so we can be praying every day. Uh, the scripture readings and questions to help you prepare for next Sunday when we begin a new uh, work worship series entitled Extravagant Generosity. Uh, it's also, again, a reminder of communion service, so make sure if you're worshiping from online to pick up your communion elements uh, before worship if you're here in Los Alamos. In his letter to the Romans, Paul writes about the death and resurrection of Christ and says, Do you not know that all of us have been baptized into Christ Jesus, who, who were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death. So just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father so too might we walk in the newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you must also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. So as a forgiven and reconciled people, alive in Christ, go forth to proclaim the good news. And may the love of the Father and the strength of the Son and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you today, tomorrow, and forevermore. Amen. Now go and be the church.
you. <laughs>